evening. Um, so I'm going to talk to you uh, today about brain sugar. So uh, my name's Oli Keane, you just heard. Um, I'm a neurobiologist at the Danish Research Centre for Magnetic uh, Resonance Imaging. Um, I just want to say thank you for coming. Uh, I mean, I'm, fun I'm fully aware that all the bodegas and nightclubs and uh, football games are on today, and you're in a museum uh, about to listen to some science, so you've already won my love and respect for doing so, so thank you. Um, so I want to talk to you about sugar. Now sugar, um, if you imagine that you were, say, living in the year 3013 and you were a history student doing research on archive media on the early 20th, uh, 21st century, you might be forgiven for thinking that sugar is actually a highly policed, highly illegal drug if you're a particularly lazy student that only watch YouTube. Um, Noam Chomsky, the most famous academic of the time, uh, said this, he said that uh, sugar is the most lethal substance known to, to man, only second was tobacco. Everywhere we look in the media, sugar is a problem. Sugar causes obesity, sugar causes neurodegeneration, attentional deficits, dementia, so on and so forth. And you might conclude that from looking at the political debates about sugar. Uh, uh, politicians are arguing about how best to limit the damage that sugar does to us. And that you might conclude that there's no, although this is an age where we're aware that sugar is a, uh, is a major health problem, we've still not fully resolved how to solve it. I want to talk about a more ancient problem than that. So long before we became aware that sugar was a problem for our health, long before the rise of the industrial uh, food production that would arguably caused it as a problem, I would argue that sugar has been a fundamental problem during our evolution. So if you look at any, any organism whatsoever, from the very big to the very small, arguably every organism that has ever lived that's meant to be a bacteria. I'm fully aware it's an absolutely massive bacteria, but if it was to scale, you wouldn't be able to see it. Um, every organism from the very tiny to the very big has had to solve this problem. And the problem is this, that we run on batteries, right? And if we don't recharge those batteries, then we're gone, right? It's as simple as that. So I'm going to talk to you about how it is that the brain deals with this problem, and how the, this problem constrains the way that brains are designed and the way that they work. So, it should be pretty obvious to you that the, uh, that the body consumes energy, but here's some, uh, some figures as to just how much it consumes. So if you just literally sit down and do nothing, not even sit, because sitting involves postural muscles that consume energy. But if you lie down and do nothing, absolutely nothing, you'll consume about 2,000 calories. Huh? Huh? Per day. Per day, yes, sorry. Not just a single instance of lying down, but a whole day, 2,000 calories. If you are a happy, uh, heavy laborer like this chappy here, uh, you might consume up to 7,000 calories. That's a dear friend. If you're a total freak, then you might consume up to 12,000 calories. So there is, there is quite a diverse range um, in the amount of calories that you consume in a given day. And I guess you're thinking that yes, it has something to do with the physical activity uh, or the variations in physical activity, and you'll be right. The interesting thing is that even if you do no physical activity, the, the body is consuming energy. As we said, it consumes 2,000 calories just doing nothing. Well, it's not doing nothing. It's doing a lot more than nothing. It's keeping you alive. Everything you can think of, your, your heart racing, keeping your circulation going, cellular transport, digestion, lactation, defecation, healing, and a whole bunch of other mechanisms you would you've never have even thought of. All of those processes require energy, and that's where the energy goes, that's why it costs 2,000 calories just to, just to lie down. Just to put it in perspective, this is the most energy dense burger in the United States, uh, and that's just about 2,000 calories. So, 
that's just the that's just the body. What about the mind? What about the brain? Um, well, it may have occurred to you that um, you know things like playing chess or making difficult decisions, uh, reading very difficult and penetrable books. That takes a lot of mental energy. I I tried reading this. I got halfway through. <laughs> Um, it's the most difficult book in the world. Um, but even something as mindless as watching a Jennifer Aniston movie is going to consume quite a lot of energy. Even if you don't have to think because you already know what the plot is going to be, right? I haven't even watched the film and I know that somehow she's inherited a puppy, the puppy causes trouble and, you know, she's sarcastic. But even if you're, you're not thinking whilst you watch that, that movie, your mind is still consuming energy. So just, just alone to, to, to process the visual information coming from the screen, this is, in case it's not obvious, this is a, this is, to get this image you have to chop my brain in half like this. Um, just, to, just to process the sensory information coming from the screen, well that has to impinge on the retina, and the retina has to uh, transduce it into electrochemical um, impulses that get sent to the back of the brain. The back of the brain will then process the motions, the colours, the depths, the faces, the objects. All of that consumes energy. Everything, everything that your, your mind has ever done, every, every perception, every emotion, everything you've ever been conscious of has consumed energy. That's kind of a strange thing. It, it, I study the brain on a daily basis and, and that just recently dawned on me. And it's even the stuff below consciousness as well, right? All the unconscious mechanisms of your brain, monitoring your heart, controlling your breathing, all of that stuff that you're not even aware of, that also costs energy. So how much energy does it cost? Well, it costs, actually, it depends how you look at it. it I think it costs remarkably little. It costs about the same as a 20-watt bulb. It, it consumes energy at the same rate as a 20 watt bulb. It's a big part of your uh, daily energy consumption, but it's still relatively efficient given that it's responsible for all those magical feelings, all those feelings of sorrow. So from this perspective, energy can be thought of as a cost, right? So the cost you can think of is to do something like, I don't know, flap my arms up and down, well, that has a cost in the sense that it drains your batteries. You might only do it a small degree, but if you keep going, it's going to keep draining your battery. Now, that's, that's quite dangerous in a sense because it's taking you closer to, to death, ultimately. If you don't recharge in time, then, then you can no longer survive. It may not seem like that, that's a big problem right now, but if we consider how difficult it was prior to agriculture, this was a daily concern, the concern of where the next meal was coming from and whether we were going to be able to recharge our batteries. Does anyone know this character? No? Blaine? Yeah, it's David Blaine. So he um, put himself in a glass box, um, hung uh, just near Tower Bridge in London. I went to see him and he basically starved himself. He starved himself for uh, approximately four weeks. He only had water and uh, vitamins. And this is a good example of what happens when your batteries start draining. So this is, this is time along here, and this is the, um, the, uh, the energy stores that are separated for carbohydrate, fat and protein. So you can see immediately carbohydrate is gone within half a week. And then slowly he starts losing his fat stores, and ultimately as it, it prolongs, then he starts wasting his body breaking down the proteins of his, of his actual uh, body. Round about, as time goes on, then the prospect of, of death becomes more and more salient, more and more probable. He obviously survived, he was very fit, he's living in a modern world, but if he was in the wild and prior to agriculture, just a few weeks of, of, of starvation could seriously compromise your ability to live. So that's the fundamental cost of, a, of, of energy in terms of our survival. So what about the brain and the sugar, right? So as I said, it, it, the brain consumes t approximately 20 watts. 
Well, it, it, it is able to consume that by virtue of a very rich uh, blood flow system that uh, penetrates all corners of the brain. The brain is very unusual compared to other organs, except for the retina and the gonads. It needs, um, it needs constant uh, oxygen and it needs constant glucose. It needs a constant supply of both. So most of the parts of the body can do without oxygen for, a, for short periods of time. And they can also do without glucose. They can, they can consume it from other sources. But the brain needs a constant flow of both. So I guess you might think, well, hold on, what about David Blaine again? He did this big stunt where he held his breath for 20 minutes nearly. The record was just broken. It's now 22 minutes of world record. How did, how did his brain survive without oxygen for 20 minutes? Well, the thing is, it didn't. It's, well, it did survive. Um, but it, it still had a constant flow of oxygen. It's no exception to this rule. He just trained himself to use oxygen very slowly. He spent those 20 minutes consuming the oxygen from that final breath before he went in the, in the water. So we have very well adapted systems for keeping glucose stable. So uh, this is a graph that shows um, glucose over time. Glucose is in red. And this is uh, a single day. So you can see it spikes after breakfast. It spikes upwards and then comes down. Again at lunch and again at dinner. But the thing to notice is that it's actually pretty stable. It's, it's within um, you know, a bound of like 15, say, units. Um, and that's important because of what I just said, that the brain needs a constant supply of glucose. If it came down to, to zero, then the brain would um, very quickly go into, uh, it could become unconscious, it could go into coma, you could get brain damage, and ultimately you can die um, through that process. So it's very important to keep the glucose uh, flowing around the body within stable limits. How does it do that? I think some of the other talks may talk more about this, but it has well adapted systems for regulating glucose. So for instance, the liver and the pancreas, they can secrete hormones such as insulin and uh, glucagon that basically deal with, with um, times when there's too much glucose and, and, and instantiate um, processes that get rid of the excess glucose. But they also help when glucose is too low. So when your blood sugar drops between meals, it can, it can uh, bring about cellular processes that start to break down glucose from larger molecules back into glucose and then circulates around your body and keeps your brain continually bathed in, in glucose. The brain also contributes to this process uh, in all sorts of complex ways, but the body is surprisingly good at maintaining that stability. Now the exception is if you have um, uh, uh, difficulties such as um, uh, diabetes, and then you need treatment to, to help regulate that process. Again, David Blaine is no exception to this, uh, to this rule. Um, he will have undergone the same bodily progression um, of converting fats and proteins back into glucose to keep his brain alive as he starved himself for those four weeks. So you might have seen that little um, icon. Um, that's, your, that's your laptop effectively monitoring its own energetic state and then telling you to do something about it, right? Um, that's perhaps where computers and humans can uh, differ. Um, we, we, have to, we can recharge ourselves, the computer just tells us to recharge it. So how do we recharge ourselves? Obviously food has something to do with it, but I'm interested in the fundamental processes that the brain has to uh, go through in order to recharge the brain and the body. So it has to sense glucose, right? It has to sense its own state, its own glucose state, and then do something with that information. And what it has to do with that information is to then change how much you value glucose. If you are in a low glucose state, then you need to start prioritizing glucose. Otherwise known as hunger, right? You need to increase the value of sugary foods. 
And then it needs to go about actually finding the food. You need to go out there in the world and either forage or pick berries or, you know, go to uh, uh, Super Brooks. Is anyone, is anyone here diabetic? No. Does anyone know what this device is? Uh, no. It's a blood glucose uh, measurement. Yes, good. So it's a continuous glucose monitor. And uh, diabetics will use it to help them consciously regulate their own glucose because of their, their difficulties. Uh, but fortunately, we actually have our own continuous glucose monitor in the brain. It's in the hypothalamus, uh, just there. So if, we, if I face that way, and we split my brain down the side, and we open it up, then the hypothalamus is, is somewhere in there. And interestingly, within a particular small part of it, we have these two different populations of cells um, called glucosensory cells. And one population of those is excited by glucose. So when, whenever glucose is high in your, in your blood system, then it, it increases the rate at which it fires action potentials, those electrochemical impulses that the brain processes that information with. And the other, the other population of cells are inhibited by glucose. So whenever glucose then these cells stop firing those action potentials. So by looking, if, if another part of the brain wants to know what state uh, the body is in, it just needs to receive information from these two populations of cells. So, okay, let's suppose we, we've solved this problem and we're good at sensing glucose. We need to do something with it, right? So, it's quite clear, we've, we've known for a long time, ever since Aristotle, in fact, that food is better when you're hungry, right? I'm very grateful to Aristotle for all the profound truths he's teach, taught us about philosophy and happiness. This is perhaps one of the, the more obvious things that he's taught us. I think we would have figured it out ourselves. It's embedded in our language, hunger is the best sauce in English. In Danish, I understand it's this, hunger is the best spice. Um, my favourite one, the one that I've made up, is even Donald Trump stops for lunch. Uh, but I'm not sure that will catch on. Um, so, basically what I'm interested in as a researcher is well, how do, we, how do we go about looking at how the brain values glucose and changes it according to the state of the body? So there's been some interesting animal work on this, which, which then promotes the question... Two minutes. Yeah. It promotes the question, well, how do we know what the animal is, is feeling? How do we know how much it values glucose? I might have to skip this bit. Basically, if you put glucose on the tongue of a baby, on a, on, a, on a monkey, or on a rat, you get a very characteristic brain response, which is to, to do a tongue protrusion. So you go, it's a very uh, inbuilt reflex. And we can use that as a measure of how much a rat likes something. So then when we go into the brain, we can put different chemicals on different parts of those brains brain parts, and we can see which, which of those chemicals in which of those locations will increase the liking response, will actually increase how much the rat enjoys the glucose. And what they found is that there's some very small brain areas, which when you put on particular drugs, you can increase that liking of the glucose. And it's very interesting because this drug in particular, this is a neurotransmitter that is released by these cells here. So that gives us a link between a hunger representation in the hypothalamus, which is sensing how much glucose we have going around our body. It then sends that information into those other brain regions, and then it increases the value of the glucose. And that's so important for the animal then to value the glucose more, and then to go out into the world and to find it. So it sounds like such a simple effect, but it's a profoundly important uh, discovery. And it's profoundly important because we know so little about this, this relationship uh, in terms of the valuation of food. So this is, this is what I want to do in my research, is to use uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, where we can give people glucose as they play different games.
and we can look at trying to look at the system within the human brain to see if the human brain does does it in similar ways. Uh, and it's been funded by these uh, nice people, Lindbergh Funded and the Danish Agency for Science, Technology and Innovation. Thank you very much.